Well, Ukrainians are being told to switch off their electricity from 7 this morning to 11 this evening. It's in response to Russia's widening strikes against energy facilities. The national grid operator says the curb is limited to Thursday, but more restrictions and blackouts may be needed with winter approaching. For many Ukrainians, though, the eight-month war has already meant living without power, heat or running water. Preparing dinner in a makeshift outdoor kitchen. Nine-year-old Artem and his grandma Irina are hurrying to get dinner ready before the setting sun plunges their home into cold and darkness. It's really cold. I'm sleeping in my clothes in my apartment now. <clears throat> Russian strikes have cut off utilities in cities and towns across Ukraine. And many residents here in the Kharkiv region have been living without gas, water or electricity for weeks now. Our windows were damaged. Now we are only eating here but sleeping in the next apartment because their windows are not damaged. So it's warmer there. For many people, bundling up at night and cooking outdoors is a matter of survival. The situations like this, no electricity, no water, no gas, we're cold, you can see we're building fires. Anton lives with his mother. She's disabled and is totally dependent on her son's help. It's really cold now. If it weren't for my son, I would freeze. The homes of residents living in villages like these in the Kharkiv region have been thrust into a pre-industrial era with no modern comforts. Authorities are trying to reassure people that electricity will be restored soon and that repairs to water and gas infrastructure will come next. But with the war and with absolutely no certainty, People like Artem and his grandmother can only prepare for what will likely be a very harsh Ukrainian winter. Let's get an update on the war in Ukraine with Matthias Berlinger. He's in Kyiv. Um, I believe there has been some movement as far as Ukraine's military goes, tightening the noose around Russian forces around Kherson. Could you tell us more there? No, we don't have any... Uh, uh, confirmed uh, 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 advances yet, but fighting is going on there, and we've seen some signs in the past few days that uh, it does not look very good for the Russian occupational troops there. Uh, the command, uh, the commander for the for, for Ukraine, uh, the Russian commander for Ukraine, has said it's very difficult. Um, authorities have started to. Um, they call it evacuate people from these areas, but there is the suspicion that these might be forced movements, that these might be deportations. We don't uh, have uh, any definite information on that. Um, and uh, British intelligence assumes that uh, Russia might be retreating from the city of Kherson. This would be, of course, a major development, uh, Kherson being the only administrative centre that Russia has been able to capture in the beginning of the war. I think the next days will bring uh, very interesting news there. Um, at the same time, uh, you listened in to the German Chancellor's policy speech just earlier uh, with me. Is it disappointing from where you're standing to hear that the EU does have the funds to fight its energy crisis, uh, that Germany does continue to support Ukraine but doesn't have anything concrete uh, to, to promise the Ukrainians in, in this urgent time of need. Yeah, basically, Scholz has reiterated what he has been saying and doing before, has listed all the things he's done in the past. There was a, a, um, a new specific announcement of training that, that was from this week, training of Ukrainian soldiers in the EU. But overall, he's not made any announcements. Now, I think the good thing is that governments have ways to talk to each other besides public speeches and uh, that the more important information will be conveyed in bilateral speeches. So we do not know whether anything is in the making. But for now, Scholz has really not announced anything. There's really nothing new in this speech with, with concerns to uh, 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 the 
support of Ukraine militarily or financially. He said it, that Germany will continue, but no new announcements. Matthias, how urgent would you say that Ukrainians need uh, help and need more help right now as far as things go on the battlefield? Well, there's, for one thing, there's the issue of the tanks uh, that Ukraine wants, modern Western tanks, to, uh, that, that would be used in these advances, as in Kherson, as we've been talking about. Um, but uh, the, what, what the past two weeks with these massive attacks on infrastructure have shown that, is that Ukraine needs better air defences. Germany has started delivering air defence systems to Ukraine. The IRST is considered one of the most advanced systems uh, that can hit planes, rockets, etc. But uh, with these new drones, there are also other needs now. The drones, they fly lower, they're harder to catch, they can fly zigzag, they're harder to uh, be spotted by raiders, etc., etc. And there are systems for that, and uh, there are German manufacturers uh, producing uh, these, this kind of systems. There are also others, uh, Swedish, South Korean, Israeli, we're hearing. Um, but uh, this is certainly something that Ukraine would want from Germany and that probably talks will go on about. We have heard nothing about it. We've just heard from sources that uh, this is something that Ukraine wishes to have. Um, but uh, it might be easier for Germany to make a move on that uh, than on the tanks, which seem to carry a very symbolic uh, meaning for Scholz uh, and, and uh, for the SPD in the, in the government, German battle tanks against Russian tanks. Uh, uh, this is not the same case for air defenses. So let's watch what uh, will come out of these talks and also the question on how quickly these can be produced. The German um, uh, military industry hasn't been uh, very productive, hasn't been outputting a lot in the past. 30 years because demand wasn't that high, um, so uh, it might also take some time for any system to be delivered. DW's Matthias Bollinger in Kyiv following the war in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Russian President Vladimir Putin has declared martial law in the four regions of Ukraine that Moscow illegally annexed after a series of discredited votes just weeks ago. Kremlin-backed officials in Kherson, one of those regions, announced it would move civilians out of the area ahead of an expected Ukrainian offensive, a step that could amount to forced deportation. Kherson was one of the first Ukrainian cities to fall to Russian forces. Now Ukraine is preparing to retake control. These images by a Russian-installed official claim to show fortifications outside the city. As Russian forces are retreating from Kherson, Vladimir Putin blames Ukraine for defending its territory. The Kyiv regime refused to recognize the will of the people, rejects any proposals for negotiation. As gunfire continues, civilians die. <coughs> Putin declared martial law in the four Ukrainian regions that Moscow illegally annexed. We are working on solving very complex large-scale tasks to ensure security and protect the future of Russia, to protect our people. The move is seen as a clear response to recent military setbacks as Ukraine counter-offensive advances. The situation in the area of the special military operation can be described as tense. The enemy is not abandoning its attempts to attack Russian forces. Our further actions and plans regarding the city of Kherson itself will depend on the military and tactical situation. I repeat, it is already very difficult as of today. Putin's decree came on the day that Russian installed officials in the Ukrainian city of Kherson announced they would move civilians in anticipation of an imminent Ukrainian attack. And we can now speak to investigative journalist and writer Catherine Belton. She works for The Washington Post, and she is the author of the 2020 book, Putin's People. Ms. Belton, welcome to DW. What do you make of Putin declaring martial law in the annexed territories? What's his strategy here? 
Um, he's obviously very worried about this Ukrainian counteroffensive. Uh, it does look like they're very, very close now to taking Kherson, and he's sort of making steps to make it clear to his population that this is Ukraine's aggression, not Russia's aggression. And in fact, an advisor to the defense ministry has said that he's worried that what the Russians are doing are preparing the ground uh, for a kind of a misinformation campaign. He's worried that this evacuation is preparing the ground for some kind of bombing attack, which then the Russians could blame on the Ukrainians. Um, so there's all kinds of shuffling going on, but really uh, the bottom line is the loss of Kherson for Putin is going to be a very big blow. Mm. Every move Putin makes is a further escalation, it seems. Is he just digging a deeper and deeper hole for himself, or can he actually turn the tide of the war? You know, it's very difficult. Obviously, he's already been backed into uh, forcing uh, the mobilization of his own people. He'd always promised that he was never going to have to do that. It's a deeply unpopular step, which really undermines the foundations of his own presidency. His legitimacy as president is based on his popularity. And really, by bringing the war home to Russians now, uh, bringing it not, it's not like the, they, it was popular among Russians because they were watching almost as if they were watching a football match on TV, but now they're risking the lives of their loved ones, uh, people who might not come back uh, from the front, who are going to be barely trained and equipped to fight the Ukrainians. And, and really, uh, he never wanted, it was a measure that he never wanted to take, and it's already uh, leaving him very vulnerable to criticism within his elite. And by declaring martial law, Putin is also in a way admitting that Russia is in fact at war, something that he's trying to avoid until now by labeling it a special military operation, hasn't he? What could be the domestic repercussions of this? You know, I think, I mean, with each stage over the past month, as Russia has lost more and more territory to the Ukrainians, uh, Putin is sort of preparing the ground, it seems, for this recognition of what he's called a special military operation as a war. First, you have the mobilization, now the martial law in these Ukrainian regions and a kind of a, a semi-martial uh, law status, even within uh, Russian regions itself on the borders uh, of Ukraine, where there's going to be stricter laws enforced uh, and economic mobilization to support the effort. So all the while, it, it's creeping closer and closer to that. And, and really, uh, this having a big impact on his uh, standing in the elite and among the population. There was a recent opinion poll by uh, the Kremlin Link Public Opinion Foundation, which found that 70% uh, of Russians are now very, very anxious about what's going on. Uh, he's really bringing, bringing the, the situation situation home to ordinary Russians. So I think his position is, is much more precarious than it's ever been in his entire presidency. Who is still on board with this war? You wrote a book called Putin's People. Who are Putin's people at this stage? You know, uh, we're seeing divisions emerge uh, within the elite around him. Of course, there are hardliners who are pressing uh, Putin to act ever harder against Ukraine. Uh, I mean, he himself uh, well, sees this war that he began almost by accident because he believed that, uh, you know, at the first sight of Russian troops, uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine would just run away. I don't think he ever envisioned envisaged that eight months on he'd still be fighting this war, but uh, it has gone and he's backed into a corner. So there are hardliners such as uh, Evgeny Prigozhin, uh, who's a longtime ally of his from St. Petersburg, who has sent his own mercenaries in to fight in Ukraine. Uh, there's another hawk called Nikolai Patrushev, who is the head of uh, Russia's Security Council, who was very instrumental in, in paving the way towards this war in Ukraine. He told Putin uh, just days before at a now infamous Security Council meeting that the U.S. was using Ukraine as a platform to destabilize uh, Russia and undermine it. And he told uh, Putin that we, our task is to defend uh, Russia's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, so he's pretty much telling Putin what to do. And so he's definitely a hawk. But there are 
definitely those are within Russia's economic elite now who are becoming more and more aghast at what's going on. Uh, in the summer, they were perhaps content to let the war rumble on in East Ukraine. Uh, they were hoping to divert trade flows through China and India uh, in an avoidance of Western sanctions. But that's becoming ever more difficult. And they're seeing Putin lose territory. And that's not just uh, a loss uh, to his popularity. It's it's kind of a loss to his standing within the elite. And suddenly he is becoming fair game. Yeah, Putin has been going to great lengths to place the blame for Russian defeats on his defense minister. But he is the commander in chief of the Russian armed forces. So are people starting to point fingers at him? Well, we've seen some reporting out of the U.S., I think, from some, some colleagues uh, who said that uh, Putin had was personally taking command of the army, that he was actually issuing orders himself, uh, trying to sort of in, kind of inveigle himself into the day-to-day -day operations. So at some point, uh, it is going to come back to bite him. I mean, so far, most of the criticism has been directed at his military chiefs, but uh, I think that's getting harder and harder to keep a lid on, especially as we see this constant retreat. Catherine Belton, investigative journalist and writer. Pleasure speaking to you tonight. Thank you so much.